Hey. Hey, hi. Hi, hi. So, I, I think everyone's had lunch and hope no one's sleepy. Oh, it's okay. So, I'm a freelance journalist and I largely cover environmental and wildlife themes, specifically climate change and wildlife. And joining me today are a bunch of really amazing filmmakers whose movies I've had the privilege to access and watch. Um, so, uh, to start off, like, let's just do a quick round of introductions. Uh, so we can start with Malaika and Nitya, and then we can show the trailers of the films and then move on to the next participant. Yeah, sounds, sounds good. good. So, yeah, sure. So my name's Nitya and uh, Malaika and I work together and we recently made a film on the illegal trade in manta rays and how India has become a big source for um, supplying these manta ray gill plates for markets in China and Hong Kong, and it's an investigative um, documentary mapping Malaika's journey as she uncovers the various facets of the story. And yeah, that's what we're going to speak about today. Okay. Yeah, and Malaika. my, I'm a wildlife researcher, Malaika, and my focus is telling stories about how people interact with the natural world. And in the recent past, I've been making more documentaries that are about the wildlife trade with Nithya. And we recently wrapped up two films. One is Palm New Soil, which is on the platform, and then another one that we also be talking about. So yeah, I'm excited to hear everyone's stories today. Okay. Yeah, uh, Susan? Okay, I'm just unmuting myself. Um, uh, I'm Susan Scott. I'm a film director based in South Africa, uh, and I just finished um, uh, our second film, um, I do a lot of work with Bonnet Debat, who's a wildlife television presenter. She um, makes films with me. And, and we just finished a second film that had, and, and the reason why I'm saying this is it had nothing to do with wildlife trafficking. I think we were so traumatized after we did the investigative journal, you know, filmmaking, uh, we, we, we made a, a much lighter film. But the film that's playing at the festival is called Struip, Journey into the Rhino horn war and um, in that we we look at the plight of rhinos and why they are being killed so obviously based here in South Africa we take a look at that and then we go to Asia and have a look at the wildlife trafficking that's happening there so a bit naive we thought it would take us six months but it ended up taking uh, taking four years so um, we're just thrilled to have it seen in India at the, at the festival so so thank you very much for the selection. Jaswini? Uh, so I kind of, my name is Yashaswini and I kind of awkwardly sit with the group here because I don't I have a, um, a clear pathway of making films in terms of subject base, but my film is called That Cloud Never Left. And it's uh, based on a community of people who make very small sounding toys using a lot of leftover material. And this time it happens to be a material made out of film strips. So there are a lot of old Bollywood, Tollywood or B-grade films that are cut up into pieces and they make these wonderful little sounding toys. Um, so I have a more interest in movements and migrations of people, but who come from very different parts of India. Um, so yeah, I'm more interested in this conversation to listen about how you approach uh, your wildlife, your nature, uh, kind of thematic kind of focus. So I'm happy to be on this panel and this discussion. Thank you for inviting me here. Yeah, thank you. I think we can play trailers now. Can we start with uh, Susan Scott's trailer? Uh, yeah, and I think um, the other one we're not necessarily playing now. Is that what you agreed on, Malaika and Niti? Sorry, I will also come and screen, so I'm not invisible to everyone. <laughs> um, or, yeah, so I will maybe start showing the one trailer, um, Stroop, and then we'll work with your other footage later on when you, when you let me know. Sounds good. Okay, awesome. Just bear with me for one second. <laughs> okay, here we go. I just opened the door and then that's when I saw these five guys holding the girls. I saw the big axe. I knew they didn't come for us. I knew it was for the rhino. The Kruger National Park is home to the largest population of rhinos on the planet, and they are being poached here. An epidemic of slaughter, and at this rate, the rhino is doomed. And on the ground, the situation resembles war. 
is the only one suspect that's been arrested. Yeah, only one suspect, the Chinese national. The whole supply chain might start in Kruger, but where the hell does it end up? The center of the illegal trade in horns is Vietnam. There's no turning around now. The rhino, it will go like blood, not bloody sick. 94 US dollar for one gram. 94? It's a rhino. And let them turn that work net gemist. The court will note that the case number two is not present. He was shot and killed in Kruger after he was released on bail. Is it written today that I die? I don't fear being shot. I fear making a mistake and landing up in jail. I got to do something. I'm going to stand up for the rhinos. Back home for my people, this piece of rhino horn is a symbol of death. What do you say to that? We come across this beautiful, beautiful animal lying dead there. And the only thing that is gone is a horn. And you just think to yourself, what a waste. OK. Um, yeah, I, I just watched this film last night and it's, I would recommend everyone, like whether you're interested in wildlife, you're not, like whatever it is, I think I sh everyone should watch this. Because what we think as commodities, um, I think I don't think anyone needs a rhino horn more than the rhino itself. Um, so yeah, this was, this was a pretty painful watch. Um, I want to start off with Susan. So Susan, can you just briefly give us an idea about what it took to make this um, the kind of research, like you just mentioned that it took about four years, even though you initially you thought it would take six months. So a bit of the process, what went into it and the research. Yeah, well, thanks Rishika and thanks for, for taking the time to, to watch it. I, I, know, I know it's a difficult watch. It's, it's, it's very tough. Um, you, know, we, we, you know, we always say that and I think that I think the what we did actually and what we say a lot of the time as well is you know the first hour is is relatively informative you know if you can get through to the first hour at least get your facts and you get a bit more information and if you don't obviously want to see some of the tougher stuff you can kind of you know slip out after the first hour but i think what happens is people become so pulled into the story they stay for the whole thing because um you know when we were you know um the person that you saw there in the trailer uh, is wildlife uh, television presenter, I mentioned her earlier, Bonnet de Bot, and, um, and her and I, we actually, uh, we were doing work here in South Africa uh, for a relatively, um, a, a relatively, it was a small story, but sort of like a, a 12 or 13 minute uh, informational piece for our national broadcaster. So Bonnet and I came together on that, we worked on that, and I knew nothing about rhinos. I had been working with Derek and Beverly Joubert, the filmmakers. I was their editor for six years. I had been working on mostly lion films. I had a BBC Wild Dog project I was working on. And I remember at the time saying, you know, I know Bonnet knows rhinos, but, you know, as a filmmaker coming in, I'm, I'm not really that familiar with the rhino story. I know rhino poaching at that stage in 2013 had just started. I know that it's, you know, it's starting to, to pick up, but I'm not really the person to tell the story and the person who was commissioning from the national broadcaster said, well, you're exactly the person to tell the story because you come from a, you know, you've got a clean slate, you know nothing about rhinos. And I think, you know, you'll be able to look at the story cleanly. And um, so, yeah, so we jumped in and did the small story for the national broadcaster. And when we were working on it, both Bonnet and myself said to each other, my goodness, um, I thought I knew what was going on with rhinos. And both of us are, are in the wildlife film industry, so to speak. And there was so, it was so complex and so layered. And, and we said to each other, well, somebody's making a film about this, right? And the thing is, is it's so, people are so on edge here with, um, you know, all the uh, anti-poaching units, the reserves, they don't allow film crews to come in. And obviously because Bonnet is very well known here in South Africa, that gave us immediate access or the ability to access because people knew her, they trusted her. And uh, so when we started approaching our national parks, um, private reserves, owners, vets, um, 
the, the prosecuting authority here in South Africa, when we started looking at the judicial system, they already knew Bonnet from TV and that, that helped tremendously. So um, I know other filmmakers that have been looking at the elephant situation and they haven't been able to get, to get anywhere. And I'd be interested to know with Malaika, because obviously Malaika is also a, a television presenter, if that helped Nitya and Malaika uh, on their journey. But for us on our journey, it, it, it helped tremendously. And, um, you know, we, we were very naive. We thought, as I mentioned earlier, we thought it would take six months and it ended up taking four years just because it was so complex and so layered. And as we would get into something, so we would find something else. And of course, we were also, my background was making television for Discovery, National Geographic, Bonnets for the National Broadcaster. And we both knew we would have to do it independently uh, if we got a commission, uh, they would obviously have a broadcast date, they would wrap us up to that broadcast date, and we didn't know how long it would take us. And also, the, we have to be mindful of something similar to censorship, where um, you put a film like this out there, and, you know, and, and as you already mentioned, Shiga, it's, it's such a hard watch, you know. Um, we didn't want it to be cut down or tailored in any way, especially the corruption elements. So it was vital for us to get it done independently, and I think that's also why it took so long. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. So the first few minutes of the movie, it's soft where you connect with the species itself. Um, and even, even the, the person who's there, the, the first person who's at the door, um, I forgot his name. Axel. Like he's a very, Axel, correct. Yeah. He's a very relatable character and like, you, it's a very friendly shot. Like all the shots are pretty friendly. Uh, and, and then it starts to get the, the criminal angle and the blood and the violence that seeps in. I think that's easier to relate to because you related to the people and the, the wildlife first. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't get what you wanted Malaika to clarify on or, or, or to elaborate on. Like, can you, can you repeat? Um, well, well, just to go back to what you were saying about, about Axel, um, you know, the, the, you're right, Axel was, you know, quite a gentle character and I think you know, I, I'm hoping that the people people who are watching this today uh, are filmmakers who, um, you know, are, are thinking of embarking on, on, on telling an investigative journey, um, you know, like this. And things don't always go according to plan. We had we had prepared to plan with Karen, his mentor, who you see in the film. She's a well-known wildlife rehabilitator. And we stumbled across Axel. And I remember saying to Bonnet the whole time, you know, um, we should be filming Karen, you know, we shouldn't be filming Axel. And she said, oh, but he's so nice and he's such a great character. Just let's film him. I don't know how we'll use him. And as you saw, he became the central character in the film because obviously the attack at the orphanage happened. He was attacked, brutally attacked. So, you know, it's um, one never knows when you're filming, you know, on a story like this, you film everything. So my, you know, to go back to the, you know, the, the question you asked about Malaika, my, my um, my question was, on our journey, um, it helped to be able to have somebody that was a wildlife television presenter that was quite well known here in South Africa. So I was wondering if that was the same for Neche and, and, and Malaika when, when they were starting on their journey in, in, in order to get access to, to their story. Yeah, Malaika, do you want to? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, with Bonnet, she's a really well known South African personality but when I and I still am not but I'm just starting on I, I don't think that an average person in the street would be able to recognize me at all so I don't think that helped at all in terms of access because you know wildlife is pretty niche in India but what I would say is that um, when you're a presenter for an investigative documentary you're so much more than a presenter because you have to pretty much be investigating the thing real time and sometimes you have these sides to the camera right and when we first started documenting the story, I thought I was only going to be filming it in India with Nathya. We're going to be filming only at landing sites in India. But then when I began to understand that this is a transnational trade, we realized that you know this hadn't been done before where people had filmed the manta ray trade in India and then finally in China. But those missing links is what's required to actually create good policy change and to create better enforcement on the ground. And that's what I think that you know with investigative documentaries, filmmakers actually can play a really vital role. It can help you know, provide those bits of information that aren't currently in the system. So for us, it was really, really exciting to kind of go out there and follow the entire trade pipeline from India to the Indo-Myanmar border, where there's a lot of insurgency that's fueled by wildlife trafficking, and then finally undercover in the wildlife markets of Hong Kong and Guangzhou. 
And um, the entire time that we were doing the documentary, my identity was completely different. So in India, I was a student at times. In China, I was a wildlife trader. So I was a seafood buyer. So I had to do a significant amount of research into other kinds of seafood because you don't just go into a shop and ask directly for manatees or sharks or ivory. You need to know the less exotic stuff because that's what a seafood trader would so I think that research that went into our cover was very substantial and we had to spend weeks making sure that we were well coordinated as a team when we go into these dangerous situations. But I would say that going undercover and, you know, filming investigative documentaries in another country is way easier than filming it back home. And that's because when you're in China and you say that you're a seafood trader, they, they believe it within seconds. They know that you're, they think that you're a seafood trader and you can film undercover with different kinds of filming setups. But in India, when you say you're a seafood trader, that you know conjures up a different kind of image in the eyes of a real seafood trader, and they wouldn't believe that a girl my age could actually be a seafood trader. So in those situations, you know, we've gotten into trouble, we've gotten out of trouble. But um, for me, the most important thing is that I never take no for an answer. Um, so when I'm going undercover, if someone says that it's not possible, I will keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And sometimes it results in us getting into a bit of a icky situation, but that's where the importance of team kind of comes up, right? Nithya has a more relaxed, calm, you know, sensible cautious. team, cautious person in the team. And I'm a bit more pushy and adventurous. And I love the adrenaline rush from investigative filmmaking. So I think we balance each other out really well with that. Also to, to Susan's point, um, actually it was quite the opposite for us uh, at many times, especially filming in India, because we would just try and pass off as students doing some uh, something for, for, for our college or, or just like a little student project. And uh, mostly people would believe that and then they would just let us be, you know, we would be at these landing sites where mantas are caught. And for the first half an hour, one hour, people would pay us some attention. After that, they'd be like, you know, what? Oh, there's some kids just doing their own thing. And um, actually having that kind of um, anonymity or just being indiscrepit really helped. Yeah, I think both of you guys, like uh, you and uh, Malaika and Susan have had completely different experiences. Like she, what she was talking about was having a well-known presenter. But then I think you guys benefited from people not knowing what exactly you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I I can fully relate to that. So I've just had one experience where I I didn't reveal my identity. I'm yet to write the story. It's a, again about wildlife coaching. So I I benefited greatly from just telling people I'm a researcher. I'm I'm a, I'm interning with this person. I'm a student. Okay. Um, so yeah, I can relate to what you guys say. Like it's if you're doing investigative stuff, like it's it's pretty bold what Susan did. Like everyone knows who you are. Everyone knows what you're doing. But I think, or maybe it's just because I'm starting out now, I take a lot of security in people not knowing what I'm doing. And yeah, so I think. Yeah. But I do completely relate with Susan about, you know, thinking that a project would take six months and then it takes years because yeah. that's exactly how it was with us. Uh, we never imagined that the scope of the project would, you know, evolve to such a point where we're spending uh, this long working on it. And, and even in terms of how comprehensive the story ended up being, we thought it would be like a simple story in the beginning. So it's, it's really amazing when you work on a project that evolves. Oh, I think this, oh, we're back. Can you repeat what you were saying? I think you were hey. being froze. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, what I was saying was it's, it's pretty amazing to be working on a project that evolves in its scope and ambition as you go along with it. And that's quite something. And I'm sure uh, Susan experienced the same while working on it. That's, that's a different thrill that you get out of it. And, and the way you're invested in the project uh, is different when it's, when it's that sort of a project. Um, do you guys have clips to show or a trailer, Marie? Yeah, which one would you like me to pull up at this point? Uh, Peng Yunsai? Malaika? Marie, do you have the trailer with you by any chance? I think we've sent it. Yeah. I do have the impact in the presenter that you sent me, so I have um, those two ready to go. I think awesome. we can play the presenter clip. Okay, sounds yeah, good. Yeah. Thanks, Marie. Oh. 
But when you go into these stores pretending to be a business person and they actually look back at you and say, hey, but why are you here? A lot of this product is from your country. Isn't it a lot cheaper back home in India? Because that's where we get it from. And that's when it really hits home. That's when it gets you. I've received a tip off that a dealer based in Guangzhou has been importing Manta stocks from India. I'm heading across the border into mainland China to try and track this store down. All right. <laughs> yeah, Malaika, do you, do you guys want to give a brief about what it took, uh, the kind of research this took, preparation, how you went into it, and what finally came out of it? How different was it from what you had initially thought? Yeah. I think I can begin and then Nithya can talk more about the cinematography aspect of it because that is significant for doing this kind of project. So um, to begin with, I think I was personally shocked that we had manta rays in our country and that India was one of the places that had emerged as one of the biggest sources for the big illegal wildlife trade and gill trade. So just understanding the scale of the trade for me um, really shocked me at my core and I, I felt like it hadn't been documented in its full complexity in mainstream media and internationally. So when we embarked on this project, um, in the beginning, it was all over the place, but I think that towards like, you know, the end of the first year of filming over for a three or four year project, we realized that the goal would be to put manta rays on the map and to get some kind of policy protection for these animals because they are vulnerable biologically. They give birth to babies very rarely. They have a low um, sexual maturity and they just are really vulnerable because you don't see them in large numbers. But at the rate that we're currently taking them out of the ocean, you know, their populations could be completely decimated regionally in the next 10 to 15 years based on the scientists that we've been working with. So we realized, okay, this is the goal. We're gonna get, trying to get manta rays protection under the Indian Wildlife Protection Act and under Indian wildlife laws. But to begin with, we don't know what the trade pipeline is. So our goal is to kind of map out the trade pipeline. And I think it's really important for people who are trying to work in investigative documentaries to collaborate with other research organizations that already do that. Because I remember when um, there was about the hands of manta ray contraband that was seized at the Indo-Myanmar border, not by the Forest Department, but actually by the Assam Rifles, which is one of India's oldest paramilitary groups. Um, we got a tip off because we were in contact with an organization based in the US that does a lot of work with trafficking. It's unfortunate that the person who got the tip off didn't contact an Indian organization, but nevertheless, we managed to get that information and we rushed there like the same day, got that footage. So I think it's kind of like, you know, news reporting. It's a picture between wildlife filmmaking making and news reporting. We really need to act on information as it comes and process that and keep documenting the entire thing because the story is developing as you go out there. We never had a shooting script for this. We never had any idea what the final film would look like. Um, but I think that, yeah, with investigative documentaries, sometimes it can, you can, you know, you can get, let your ego get ahead of you and it can become all about you and the story and how adventurous it is. And we really didn't want to do that. So we realized that it's important to kind of have an impact, a goal for an investigative documentary like this. And then beyond the documentary work on you know, initiatives that could help further that goal. So the documentary itself is 54 minutes, but we're also creating you know, three minute cut downs of the film that can be used for policy change and to show to policymakers because no one wants to watch. I mean, most people don't want to watch a 54 minute documentary. But we also are working with an amazing team at the Wildlife Trust of India on a research initiative. So for the last couple of years, they've been doing you know, comprehensive baseline data surveys on manjuries. And I think that when it comes to investigative documentary making, it's important to kind of see what the issue is, um, document it, but then also realize this is what the solutions might look like and then get those people on board. So for us, it's about attacking it from different ends, whether that's the scientific end, whether that's the storytelling and that can draw audiences in and then also hopefully to create some policy change in the next couple of years. But yeah, I think it was an amazing adventure the entire time, whether it was in India or Myanmar or Hong Kong and Guangzhou. And we've had several run-ins, but I think Nithya managed to do a great job of documenting the entire thing. So sometimes I wasn't aware of the fact that, you know, there were people um, right behind us who were looking over his camera. So we'd have to, you know, do different kinds of tactics to ensure that we didn't actually, you know, have our cover blown. My most successful tactic was pulling out my phone and pretending I'm on Instagram. If people think you've zoned out and you're not really doing anything dangerous, like you're not, you're not up to anything. 
actually i i had one question when i was watching the film so um, in this the starting few scenes there of of a fishing market right a, a, like there are fishing communities there and there's a there's a big market and some are obviously catching mantas and they're bringing them back uh, so um with with the story that i'm doing right now i'm struggling a bit with how to portray communities so susan dealt with it brilliantly in her documentary i think if you guys haven't watched it you should because there's obviously some uh, element of marginalization there is there is a question of livelihood i i think yashaswini can add a bit here uh, about the social aspects of what she considers uh, when it comes to wildlife filmmaking or wildlife themes or even otherwise and how, how do you portray that effectively how do you portray that with some sensitivity i think she's done i i watched her film uh, it's about during the covid time the lockdown the first lockdown that india had um, the kind of impact it had on people who are already marginalized so i think if yeah if uh, yashaswini do you want to share some light on this uh i mean, first as i mean I'm, i'm kind of thinking about this word investigative a bit more like uh, i don't know lovely at this moment because i'm in this panel because i i, I mean i wonder what are uh, what because i never approach my work as you know investigating i think i form relationships with you know the environment around me and i pretty much feel like i'm part of this environment so i mean i don't i mean I, despite the fact that in india when you work on documentaries already like there are many kind of censorships which i think should be a global kind of a situation where it's not easy to negotiate like sabut the film that you're talking about which we made during the uh, lockdown time but it's a research that ekta and i have done from 2009 onwards it's on the baglam metro uh, rail construction so the bmrcl is a huge censorship factor by itself so so the kind of relationships that you form with the workers or the kind of relationship that you have with the city starts to emulate the narratives that you want to make and i think our narrative i mean for sabut i think it was an evidence making kind of a film because we wanted to make sure that the workers get their wages which hasn't been paid for two months or three months and they all wanted to walk back home and we were trying to find a way but mostly my films are more uh, interested in other kinds of psychological or emotional spaces of um, human beings where it's kind of more difficult to negotiate so i mean with the behind the tin sheets project which has three four small documentaries of the bangalore metro rail workers a huge amount of migrant population we've looked at narratives of ghost stories we've looked at narratives of love and longing and cinema stories or looked at philosophies that arise out of uh mobility philosoph- philosophies that arise out of making you know consistent kind of work so i don't so i don't really fit into this uh i don't know the thrill or the adrenal of investigation in that sense i mean i don't think of my work as investigation but more as relationships and bonds that can become then a cinema which hopes to create perception changes or changes in a much uh i don't know nuance sense perhaps um with that cloud never left i mean i think there is a sense of investigation in the sense because these stories are not if you want to go to a like i found the toy that we were making i mean the film that i wanted to make about this toy it's a very simple toy it's made out of a bamboo stick with a slit on top and it got a, like a 35 mm film frame and a red thing and i think as children all of us have played with this but i found it interesting that film by the end of its life becomes a sounding object so then when i spoke to many of the toy sellers i was like where do you guys how do you think about you know putting all these kind of leftover material together to become something and then it goes back all the way to one little village in murshidabad which is like 2 hours away from the bangladesh border but i i don't know whether i would term that as investigation but more as curiosity so then you kind of follow the route behind and uh, hang out and hang out with communities for a really long time where they participate in the ideas of film making because when i told them that i want to make the film quite red in its color or quite rotational or quite spherical then everybody is like oh yeah you know what you can shoot the hibiscus there the pomegranate there or you know here's a boat that can revolve around it um, and i was really in, i'm more interested in those kind of ideas i suppose because there's a very beautiful thing that the toy makers say in the film that you know this toy that you're holding in your hand a very small child's toy that if you rotate it it's 5 seconds in my hand but the earth that we're living on 
rotates 4,500 kilometers in a day, which means all of us are supposed to rotate. All of us are supposed to move. Why are we, the land is for the dead, not the living. So keep moving. And I think these kind of ideas make more, I don't know, I make more friendships with them or find a way to uh, emulate that cinematically or uh, philosophically or in that kind of a world. So I'm, I'm, I'm less journalistic in that sense. I mean, I'm very happy with Pari who supported my work and kind of helped me see it through. But yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm interested in how the, how investigation in these kind of spaces where Susan and Nitya and uh, Malika's work works because they're such hardcore, I think, industries to negotiate and how, so, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah. So I'm just thinking about the relationship between investigation, the kind of ideas of research and the story that comes out of it and what story starts to render meaning in, in that space, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, and Malika, I, 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 when Malaika and I were working on our film, uh, I know that we had a conversation, several conversations about this, and we were very sure that we do not want to portray any of the local communities who are, um, for whom it's a matter of sustenance, who are catching the manta ray and selling, you know, the, the guy who cuts up the mantas, he gets a daily wage to, to, to cut mm -hmm. the manta and extract the gills. Uh, a lot of the fishermen, it's about, it's about survival for them. And we really, um, had this thing in our mind that we do not want to portray them as the villains of the story. Uh, we do not want to portray them as, um, you know, as, as doing something bad knowingly. It was, it was about, uh, mm -hmm. if, if you've watched the film, there's this character Raju and Malaika forms a bit of a, spend some time with him in his home. And, and all of that is not just on screen, it's real. Like when, when Raju got married a couple of months ago, he called up and he's like, come, come for my wedding. And, so that was something that we really wanted to do, um, have that sense of empathy um, and really focus on saying, look, it's the middlemen, it's the people who are boosting the trade, who are trying to make money, uh, make, make uh, a buck out of uh, these beautiful animals that live in our oceans. Maybe they need to change their ways, but it's not really up to the fishermen to say, oh, you know, this animal might go extinct, so I should stop fish, fish, you know, fishing it. So I'm kind of curious as to like, I think it's a question for both Susan and your, your film, which seems to have a certain conversation is how do you kind of hold on to like, like, of course you want to kind of reveal the structural violence that's at place, the structural kind of industry that it's placed. And how do you kind of work out that kind of sensitive space, like in the editorial or in even in the, the impulse or of, filming or how, how, how do you negotiate that? And do you not get tempted to go off into that more human story or, yeah. But the struggle, the actual eye contact between the man animal, like, because it's, I don't know whether you start to understand the kind of, I don't know, Raju, this character, like why he's doing that. And yeah, so how do you negotiate this character the systematic violence and how your camera or editing operates between those things. I'm really curious. Yeah. So I think that, you know, when you're telling a story like this, you have to think about what the larger picture is in a more journalistic, um, less emotional way to begin with, at least that's the way I approach it. And if I think about it in a less emotional way, um, if manta rays are continue, like if they're, if they're hunted for the next 20 or 30 years, they will go extinct. And at that point, that fisherman will lose his livelihood anyway, right? So we have the opportunity right now to protect the species, but while we protect the species, we need to put in as much effort and initiative into protecting the communities that work alongside them. And we haven't figured that out, honestly, we haven't, because um, manta is on their main source of income. So it's not like, you know, they are manta hunters only. They also get tuna, they also get different kinds of things. Um, but we realize that you know if we can create sustainable livelihoods for those communities in that area, and if we can use our documentary to help other people realize that this is an issue that needs addressing, we could do something along those lines. And like Mithya mentioned, I mean, it's definitely about not just portraying the people who are fishing and killing manatees as villains, but just showing them as people who are just trying to get by like you and me and just make sure that there's enough food on the table for their families like everyone else. But another point that I'd like to bring up, um, because we've talked about the you know, the beginning of the trade pipeline is the end of the trade pipeline, and that's the consumers. And I think with that issue as well, there's a very important need for empathy 
because our film talks about the traditional Chinese medicine trade, and that's become more relevant than ever before, given the backdrop of COVID-19 and the health implications for the entire world. I mean, given that millions of people have died, given that they someone ate a bat at one point in time, there's been a lot of racism that's emerged out of that, you know, Chinese students have been attacked in different parts of the world. And I think the narrative needs to shift from blaming one particular community to saying that this is where it's at, like calling it out. You don't have to have like tender gloves around it, calling it out, but saying that this is something that requires solutions that need cross country collaboration. I mean, this is a transnational trade at the, at the very core. Um, but also I think one of the things that a lot of wildlife trade documentaries don't bring up is that it's not just China that goes out there and kills and decimates wildlife. There's a lot of other countries as well. And recently, over the last month in November, Nithya and I and a couple of other people worked on a documentary, which was focused on the elephant trade and how elephants are taken out of the wild, brutally captured, and then um, basically taken into captivity where they have this really brutal process of training them and taming them and making them tame enough to be ridden by humans. And I have ridden an elephant way back. So we all have that context of having, you know, been a part of wildlife tourism. So it's not something that is just, um, you know, uh, restricted to say some people in China. I mean, we all have been exploitative at some point in some way we might have been. Sometimes even eating sushi might be a way of, you know, harming wildlife indirectly. So with this documentary, we know that the majority of people who actually ride elephants are people from European and American countries, um, America and Europe. And that's not talked about as much. I think that we definitely need to stop blaming China so much for wildlife exploitation and realize that we need to fundamentally rethink our relationship with the natural world. And in places where we see ourselves as you know, being higher up in the pecking order or higher up in the hierarchy, we need to question that and realize that you know, maybe there's more sustainable ways of doing it. In my opinion, going out and seeing an elephant in the wild with their family is so much better than seeing an elephant in captivity or seeing a tiger in captivity. And we need to start calling out those big issues as well that don't just relate to China. I would love to hear Susan's experience on working on the rhino trade because I would imagine that uh, hunting a rhino is a much more gory uh, thing as opposed to going out and casting a net in the sea to catch a manta ray. So how was, how was it for you portraying those communities with empathy? Well, uh, thanks, Nitya. But, you know, firstly, I just, I just want to say, um, Yasha, I, I love the, the that, that very, um, it's, it's such a, a vibrant picture that you, that you painted for all of us, you know, turning that toy around and 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 having the toy seller you know talk about the fact i mean i never even thought about that i mean it's so powerful you know the the planet's revolving however many thousand kilometers a day and we have to keep moving i mean it's just you know i i can't wait to see your film so i mean it sounds it sounds okay. fantastic and um yeah and um no thanks Nietzsche. it's it's look for us it was very difficult because um we have a, a real um, uncomfortable background to South Africa. Obviously, we've got apartheid that we have to face, and um, you know, a lot of a lot of people who live here always want to look forward and always want to look at conservation. Look, at what can we do going forward? And I think it's it's uncomfortable for everybody to look backwards. Well, not everybody. I mean, obviously, it's uncomfortable for a certain population of South Africa to look backwards and and have to face that. And I think, you know, we had to address that in the film, the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's, you look at um, somewhere like Nepal, where a, a rhino goes wandering in the streets and people, you know, call the authorities in and it gets ushered back into the park. If that happens here, it's a very different story because of, um, a, a, you know, there's this disconnect because of being kept behind a fence and not having access to wildlife. You know, wildlife is for the tourists that come in from overseas and go into the parks. And it's not something, even 26 years after we had Nelson Mandela voted in as our first president, we still have communities bordering the national parks. And um, in particular in, in Kruger, we've got 2 million people. And there's just, there's just no, there's, there's just this lack of connection. So that is, that is huge. And that is before we can, even look to um, going forward uh, here in South Africa, that has to be addressed. And I know there are NGOs, government is looking at it, but 
you know, gosh, just everything with wildlife trafficking, it's, it's slow, it's really taking a long time. Um, but you know, I, I'm going to go into, I'm going to go into a controversial area here. And I'm always so, I'm always so wary of, of, of stepping into this because when we have stepped into it, I think people think, you know, because um, because of our background and maybe because we um, are viewed as privileged, it's it's maybe we've got a, a more hard or a more um, kind of direct approach. And and I don't I don't mean that at all. I, I just I'm I'm on the side of the animals. So I just kind of, you know, when I when I hear about people talking about we need to work with communities. Yes, we need to work with communities in the right way. The communities that are law abiding, that are trying to make a difference for their children, that need help for schools. And we see it all across South Africa where um, there, there, there's a real need for proper infrastructure, help and development. But in the communities around here in South Africa, unfortunately, we are a crime ridden country and crime pays here in South Africa. And there's a big, um, a big swathe of, of people in the communities who take advantage of wildlife trafficking. And they're enabled by obviously the middlemen. And you know, we mustn't forget wildlife trafficking is a huge, huge illicit trade that garners anywhere from, I think the numbers are something like seven, 7 billion to 23 billion a year. Um, that's what illegal wildlife trafficking um, uh, you know, bring or wildlife trade, um, you know, what it brings in. And I mean, I think it's a, the third or the fourth um, highest behind, you know, arms, drugs. It's huge. It's a huge industry. So obviously, to be able to hook in and grab these criminal elements in the communities is, is very easy. And um, so it was very important for us to not interview a, a rhino poacher. Um, it was very important for us to um, not glorify that aspect. Um, so, um, you know, see, and, and we've, we've, we've done a lot of research and, they, you know, and every film is different. You know, every film on, on, on wildlife trafficking is different. And, and, you know, we didn't want to knock any of the others and say, oh, well, you did this, we don't approve of that. Or it was very much a, a personal journey for us. And as we went on the journey, we thought, you know, we need to show from almost the point of view of the people working on the ground. So, you get introduced to Axel at the beginning, the, the orphan rehabilitator. You know, he's been brought to Africa to make this difference in what he thinks, you know, one or two little individuals that he thinks, wow, in my lifetime, if I can make a difference in their lives. So it was very important for us to show that that journey, the journey of the rangers, the prosecutors, um, you know, spending time with the, with the prosecutors in court. They've got unbelievable jobs where they are threatened you know they're not even defending um children that have been raped or um families who's had a victim that's been murdered these are animals that no longer walk on the planet because they were taken out in a violent crime for wildlife trafficking and you know they go into court they come home they've been followed home they'll find um threats they've given they're given death threats so um yeah i i, I don't have much sympathy for the the, the, the part of the, um, you know, when people say, you know, we need to look at, at, at rhino poachers with, with some sort of uh, sympathy or try and figure out the background where they've come from. They are repeat offenders. Many, many times they've been arrested over and over again. They go out on bail and they go back into the national parks and are hunting rhinos again because it is so lucrative. You know, if they were in there and, and, and there are, there are people that go in there and they're hunting bush pigs or warthogs for sustenance, you know, the prosecutors also understand where that's coming from. And I think, you know, you, one can understand that with a bit more um, empathy, but to have these guys that go in there and, you know, you see in the film, they do things, I, I didn't realize this. I thought a rhino poacher goes in, takes a shot, the rhino is dead. Their, their shots, you know, sometimes you've got to shoot a rhino two, three times, and the shots are now being picked up by technology because all the national parks have got technology to try and, and help them locate where the poachers are. So now they're not they're now putting silences on these big hunting guns. And the silence the silences don't allow a, a clean shot. So it basically just maims the rhino. Then they run to the rhino with an axe and they hack on the back of the spine. So when you're sitting in court and you hear how this rhino, these three men that are sitting in court, 
trust me, you've got no sympathy when you hear how they're, they're doing it. And they, they're, they're not doing it for meat to feed, they're doing it for greed because, you know, that, that is at the end of the day, we mustn't forget that a lot of this wildlife trafficking, um, you know, the high end stuff, rhino horn, it's, it's a direct link to greed. And the fact that this is, um, this is something that pays incredibly well. I mean, these guys, they wear branded clothing. They've got the best of the best watches on and phones, and they've got the best lawyers, the best defense teams, um, you know, uh, protecting them. So, yeah, it was, it was very important for us to get that right, that balance right, show the community that's been affected because of apartheid and that that needs to change, but then also to show that there is this very high, intense, criminal aspect to, to rhino poaching. Yeah, I think I that's think a fascinating movie, perspective. Yeah. I, the way you put it, that's, that's amazing, yeah. Yeah, the movie captures this brilliantly, like everything she's just said, all the subtleties. So when, you, when you're showing communities that are living just outside of Kruger, it's, it's a different portrayal. And then when you're talking about people who hack, uh, like baby rhinos, like really small rhinos whose spinal cords are hacked. So... Uh, yeah, it is motivation. It is why are you doing this? Like, is it is it for meat? Is it to feed someone? Is it to feed the child in your house, or is it is it larger than that? Yeah, I think I, I would yeah end this with recommending the movie. And Marie is like nudging me to stop because I think there's only ten minutes left. So yeah, we can take questions. Apparently, there are a lot of questions. I I wish we had more time because everything Susan has said right now is. It had so many questions that I have. I, I didn't even ask them and she's already, I think, answered so much of it. Maybe in the next year, like next film fest next year, I don't know when. But yeah, I, I really wish, I, because that there was so much in what she said and it answers so many questions. But anyway, okay, yeah, I'll shut up now. <laughs> so then we can take questions. Oh, that sounds good, thank you. We just have some um, interesting audience questions as well. We want to, at least some of them, uh, want to ask you, uh, touching on some of the things that you've already mentioned. Um, one of them is around the response, you've kind of just talked about it a little bit, but maybe you could go into more depth about the responsibility that you feel um, to the human subjects. And uh, Yashu, maybe from your side as well, uh, I mean, you're, you're out there, you said you're forming relationships with, with the people. Um, what's, at what point, or have you had those points where you have to make a decision between um, the goal of the film that you want to make and what you want to convey and the people you have in front of you and how much of their story, uh, story you can really and t yeah, share with a good conscience? I don't know if that's uh, an issue you've ever run into, but it yeah, has been posed as a, as a question. The ethics of it. I think for my film, the kind of films that I make, I, I actually pretty much don't know what I'm gonna end up making. I kind of have very clear indications in the sense, yes, it's the Bangalore Metro Rail project. And I know it's an infrastructure project. Uh, I know the toy makers is a small scale industry, but I don't go approaching the industry. I'm more interested in What's happening in the landscape or what what the ingenious ways of kind of grabbing economy on your hands you know like uh, and kind of creating those things so there are different kinds of sets of questions but once i go there i think out of curiosity i just wait or hang around it's also for me yeah i mean it's really for me making friendships in that area uh the the Characters in my films are friends for even today. I mean, I call Chiku and Babban. They're the guys who I usually smoke or drink with, or I, I, I mean, I stay in Kakuli Didi's house. So these are like people that have formed relationships. I'm very, also very aware that I'm an outsider. I'm a city and there's a caste hierarchy. There are various kinds of uh, representations of yourself that you have to be quite uh, conscious about. And it also is, is daunting and it's scary that when you come from those privileges as to how you negotiate those uh, conversations, but there is a melting point when you allow time to float in that everybody is starting to imagine or make cinema with you. And I'm interested in those moments of where it's, uh, we're kind of thinking about eclipses or we're thinking about um, uh, story exchanges like host stories coming together, then the atmosphere of the film completely changes. Uh, so I think it's a relationship of making friendships or characters who talk like you or who feel like you or you're learning something from them and that the film is a display of that atmosphere so many of like presence and distance which is made in pinchy's project earlier they look like i mean 
they kind of look like sci-fis or, you know, the Bangalore Metro Rail projects have to look like sci-fi and unfamiliar territory while it's very much my city, you know, like, so I think the relationship between cinema, the kind of philosophy, which is kind of a journey, I'm not really very hell bent on, hey, this is my story. I'm going to say this right now. So I don't come from that journalist background. So in that sense, I, I'm, I have a lot more time and freedom to just hang around and be with people and yeah, make no, that 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 is journalistic, right? So, like, yeah, you mentioned this last time also. It wasn't journalistic, but it is like journalism. Even investigative journalism, it doesn't have to be okay. I'm interrogating you. Sit in my chair. I'll interview you. It, it, that's not. I mean, that's not always the ideal path. I think. And even with the filmmakers that we have on the panel now, it's mm. not that confrontational FBI director. Like it's it's not it's not that it's not. Like, yeah. yeah, obviously there are issues that we're dealing with that is crime, but I like, I like how you look at it. And that is journalistic. There's nothing non-journalistic about it. Expanding, expanding media surfaces. I like that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, one comment as well from the team during the discussion was that um, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, poet poetry almost to it, to the process, especially actually when we hear you talk. I mean, it's not just hardcore cutting images, which there are sometimes, but it can be quite poetic of a process. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great to hear that. So I might ask one last question. Oh, I'm also very sad that we have to stop soon. Um, but another question that came in from the audience um, has a few parts. Do you think working independently has a lot more challenges than working for an organization? Or would it be, um, would have helped you speed up the process with an organization? Or is the creative freedom um, kind of, I guess, taking rain over the time consumption. So is, is it worth it having the creative freedom and what you just described, having that possibility to move with the story rather than, um, I guess, having more resources to support you in the process? Susan, you've touched on that before. Maybe others can as well. I think, you know, when we were making our documentary, we uh, didn't have a network on board. And with other films we made, you usually have like a network, you have a, you have a channel that you're working with, you have deadlines. And I think that honestly, with a lot of investigative documentaries, they can't fit into those deadlines. If we had a deadline, we would have made a much more boring film, I'd say, than if we, then in the current situation where we had you know, the flexibility of trying to fund it ourselves and figure, figure out the way as we go. Um, I think what's helpful for people who are trying to make a documentary like this is sometimes getting non-profit partners on board who can help with access, who can help with funding. And like for example, with our documentary, we had Wild Aid funding a significant part of it. Um, that definitely helps to you know make give you the freedom that you want and not, and have the editorial say that you want, but also give you the time that you need. And I think investigative documentaries require that amount of time. Um, I think I just wanted to add a point to what we were talking about earlier with you know building a relationship with people when you're making an investigative documentary. I think in a lot of cases you can, and with some of our other films, which are about the human wildlife interface and how people coexist with say big cats, we can do that. But what I realized, um, in my work as an investigative presenter specifically, is that sometimes you can't. I mean, a lot of the times there's a very, very distinct element of you know deception. And without that deception, you can't really go out there and tell a story because you um, are having a cover all of the times. So recently when we were in Jaipur, we were doing an investigation on elephant tourism and how elephants are trafficked in the wild. And I was a YouTuber in that. So I had like a GoPro and a selfie stick and I was like, welcome to my YouTube channel. And that's Anyway, we were able to get information about how much it costs to buy an elephant, which is 70 lakhs, how much time it takes to get it, what's the process of getting an elephant out of the jungle, who are the major players in this industry, where does it go, and basically getting that vital information. So I don't think it's important to always build up that relationship because sometimes, I mean, that can expose you to threats and dangers that don't work out. But Sometimes you can not be so invested in the process and more in the goal. That's the way I think about it with investigative documentaries. It's maybe not the best way to maybe I'll figure out and be different in a few years. But right now, I think you have to have an idea of what the goal is and then and, you know realize that you have to do what it takes. And that's what we've been doing for the last couple of years with different investigations. And along the way, you make some friends like Raju, but you also make um, enemies sometimes. But as long as you get the story, I think that's what matters. Also, I think uh, sometimes in order to work with an organization um, or to have a network on board, you kind of need to know what you're doing and you don't always 
have the full picture in the beginning with a project like this. It, it, it almost necessarily has to evolve as you go along with it. Um, and that is something that is possible when you're, when you're doing it you know, independently. Thank you. Um, I'd love to hear more perspectives. Susan, do you want to have the last word? <laughs> I'll give it to you. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just, I'm, I'm so passionate about this independent um, um, aspect. And, you know, for any of the filmmakers that are watching, um, you know, independent filmmaking was not something that we got into, um, you know, that we did, uh, you know, we got into it with, with Strip. So if there's anybody that needs help on, on a journey that they're taking, please, I, I, you know, I always thought, wow, you can't contact, you know, you watch a talk, um, you know, and I was exactly there watching other filmmakers do a talk and I would think, well, I can never email them because they'll never get back to me. Um, email me. Uh, if you've got any questions, you know, just go to our, the website. I think the links are all there um, through the festival. Uh, you know, contact other filmmakers and, and ask them questions. You know, um, they'll, if you send the email and they don't come back to you, it's they're busy. It's not because they don't like you, you know, just keep, just send another mail, send another mail, but ask those questions because, you know, while Malika had, you know, spoke so passionately about working with an organization, for us, we had different issues where NGOs with the Rhino issue, they're at war with each other because one wants trade and one doesn't want trade. And it's a very different, uh, with manta rays, it's easy. With line bones, it's easy. They're all the NGOs, you know, they'll, they're able to help you. But with Rhino um, Horn, it, it was so difficult because, you know, we would go to one NGO and they'd say, but did you speak to that NGO because they're against what we believe in? So you've got to tread some of these things quite carefully. So it's not always, you know, cut out and it applied to, to every situation. And, you know, Malika will tell you that as well. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, with, with Big Cats, she's also probably um, encountered that. So, you know, if you're not sure about something, contact us and, and, and ask your questions because really the collaboration that you can get from from other filmmakers you know we we all do this with great passion because we care about our environment um yes you know it, we can be competitive in getting our films placed in in different um spheres but you know at the end of the day we all want the same thing so reach out to other filmmakers thank you so much um i would love to keep this going sadly we're well, not only sadly, it's also nice we get to hear another topic in a second, <laughs> but of course we would have loved to keep this conversation going. Thank you so much. I will um, say goodbye on behalf of Rishika for now. <laughs> Apologies for taking over. Um, really appreciated your perspective and also the offer you just made, Susan, and maybe some others um, can echo that as well to, to be approached. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Great, great. It's something that came through in the previous session as well, just the, the value of mentorship and support within the community. Um, it doesn't need to be the same subject you're, you're covering. It can, be, it can be anything. So I think that showed as well in terms of the composition we had on this panel, bringing really different perspectives to the topic of investigative journalism, even if you don't call yourself that, <laughs> on, just, on the portrayal of the, the stories that we all need to hear. So thank you so much. Um, for the audience, if you want to tune into sustainable tourism in India, taking a bit of a different approach next, um, we're on in about five minutes. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye.